So uh, in the next 30 minutes, I'm going to have uh, an adult conversation with you guys about the birds and the bees, <laughs> and about um, chart porn. What is that? So unlike uh, real CD subjects, uh, chart porn is actually, for us uh, data nerds, a uh, very nice, well-presented, good vis uh, data visualization um, that is elegant, that is pretty. And um, so I started my data science voyage with R. And um, one of the nice things about R is a package called ggplot2. Uh, please don't lynch me, but I like it very much. Uh, <laughs> it is a uh, pretty painless, oh boy. The world is against me today. <laughs> so it is a very nice, painless uh, way, a uh, painless library that allows you to get really pretty, uh, pretty plots quite easily. Uh, if we do a quick search right here with ggplot2 and go to Google Images, Google Images, here we go. You can see a few nice examples. You can see nice colors and some relatively pretty, uh, pretty plots that are, um, actually you can, I can tell you that most of these are probably very uh, quick plots that are almost out of the box, just getting the data plugged in and using uh, uh, some nice definitions. So this is a pretty convenient thing. And when I started doing uh, data science in a more production uh, environment, and of course I went back to Python, which is my, uh, native language, my mother tongue, so to speak, in programming. Um, I wanted to recreate this, recreate uh, the aesthetic standard that I'm used to with uh, the most common uh, plotting library in Python, which is matplotlib. So what I want to talk to you guys about is uh, how I'm trying to achieve that uh, in matplotlib with a few tricks and a few functions that make life easier. And uh, that's what we're going to try to do. This is an intermediate talk. Uh, and I hope you guys are familiar, uh, at least to some degree, with uh, data science tools in Python, such as pandas. And of course, a little bit of my matplotlib, at least. And, uh, but of course, if there's anything that is unclear, please stop me, because this is a pretty much a hands-on uh, talk. OK, so let's start. Um, as I said, you can find everything here on GitHub if you want to follow along with the files directly. And um, OK, so first thing we're going to do is um, we are going to import uh, a lot of the libraries we're going to use here. So of course, matplotlib, uh, we're going to import styles, which we're going to talk about, as well as uh, pyplot, the plotting uh, submodule that we're going to use, obviously. NumPy, pandas, and scikit-learn, especially for some data sets that we can play with and visualize, uh, as well as just some uh, something that helps us check if a file exists. OK, so um, <laughs> this, is our, this was supposed to be my uh, chart of demonstrating uh, the concept of chart porn. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> uh, this was meant to help us recreate it to show that it's a real plot, not just something that, I don't know, made in Photoshop or something. but. Uh, yeah, so I'm not going to go over about how this data came to be. It's based on an image, a really nice Bollywood image of two very nice looking lovers holding each other <laughs> with a little bit of image processing. But yeah, this is actually a scatter plot. And uh, we're not, we're not going to actually go over the code that re reproduces it, but I'm going to talk about uh, how you can achieve a, a similar style and uh, a few other stuff. OK, so let's start with a bit of data preparation. Of course, if we want to visualize data, we need some data. So I'm actually uh, using the IRIS data set. Um, if you're not familiar with IRIS, IRIS is a very commonly used data set for uh, learning machine learning. Learning machine learning. Um, so IRIS is actually a database of uh, data set with uh, three uh, flower species, three IRIS flower species that holds uh, uh, four features, four features of the shapes and anatomy actually of the flowers. So we have the petals, which are these flower organs, and the sepals, which are these. And we have the length and width of uh, the petals and sepals of three species of iris. So this 
this chunk of code is actually uh, taken from a Stack Overflow answer of how to take this uh, scikit-learn data set and just convert it into a pandas data frame, which is more easy to work with. And after that, I just, um, so this is like the standard code, after which I just renamed a few of the columns to have some easier to uh, read column names for the sepal length, sepal width, petal length and width, and the species. Species, there are three species. They come as uh, numerical indices. So zero, one, and two, I just renamed those into the actual name so we can have it a little bit easier. Okay, so now we have some data. Let's start visualizing. So the first thing I want to talk about is styles. Styles, I think, is one of the ways to get um, much better looking plots much uh, with very little effort. So what are styles? Styles are actually collections of graphical properties that you can uh, import and you can use in matplotlib to get immediately uh, a different look for your plots. So um, stuff like uh, how the grid lines look, what background you have, the fonts, uh, everything actually that you can define that you could customize in matplotlib plots, which is almost anything in the plots, you can define in a style and then get a consistent look for your plots. So there are actually some uh, built-in plots, uh, styles, and you can actually see them by uh, s going into style.available. Style, by the way, I just imported the style at the beginning. If you uh, remember from matplotlib import style. So now we're going to use it as style, but it's, you can just access it directly through matplotlib.style. And um, again, if we um, print the available styles, you can see that we have quite a few of those. There's a lot of Seaborn-based uh, styles, and there's also quite a few others. And just to use the style, all you have to do is style.use and then type the style name. And um, it's kind of hard to know exactly what kind of a result you're going to get. So to be able to visualize the styles, what I did is I created this function that I'm going to go into a little bit later because I want to go over a few other stuff first, but <coughs> basically what this function does, it just generates six charts, six different looking charts that we can use to visualize uh, what a style, how uh, a style represents plots. So my two favorite uh, built-in styles are the ggplot style and the 538 style. And uh, let's compare those to the basic default style matplotlib comes with. So. If I run this function with a none passed on to the style type uh, parameter of this function, we get this, uh, this plot that is six plots combined uh, into one uh, big plot, one figure, um, which shows how the default look is for a matplotlib plot. So we have a histogram here. We have some uh, line plots as well as a bar plot with you know the bar, uh, the axis uh, labels here, a box plot, scatter plot, and an image. So this is how it looks like out of the box, except for the fill, fill color here of the box plot. Usually the default is not having any fill color. I actually edit it, um, but this is how uh, a, a normal plot looks. It's actually not that bad. It's pretty nice, but I think it could be a whole lot better. And uh, let's see what we get when we just switch styles to uh, the other styles. And when we, as, as I said, to switch a style, all you have to do is uh, just type style.use and then give the style name, which is ggplot2 or 538, which we are going to see right now. So let's see what happens when we use ggplot. Okay, so this is the result for the default ggplot. Uh, these styles were actually written by normal people, by developers like you who decided to contrib contribute and try to reproduce these styles. And uh, this is what uh, the ggplot looks like. So what we have here is a little bit of difference from the default look. We have a gray background, which is something that is very much of a hallmark for ggplot, as well as these white grid lines. And uh, we have a different color scheme. This is actually not the default color scheme for the R version of ggplot, but it is uh, a different color scheme. And uh, we also have a different font, 
actually not different font, but different font sizes for titles. And so there's a few, a, a few things that are slightly different. But again, the biggest difference is the background and the uh, grid lines. So this is one version. And if we go to 538, a different uh, uh, built-in style, we can see that it is even, uh, looks even uh, different from that. We have a slightly uh, a different style of gray, a slightly brighter gray background and uh, darker gray uh, grid lines, as well as thicker lines and much bigger titles. Okay, so 538, if you guys don't know, aren't familiar with, is a website for statistics uh, made by Nate Silver, a very famous statistician from the US. Um, and uh, they are known, well known for their very pretty plots. Um, so this is, is an attempt to recreate their style. Um, and again, you have a different color scheme, different colors picked here. And uh, um, so this is a, another difference. I like the, these styles most from, uh, from the default styles that come with Matplotlib. But essentially what you can do is you can customize this further, especially if you have a good, if you have a specific look you're aiming for and you want to improve even further, you can create a custom style. So to do that, you can just uh, go and maybe edit one of the existing style, style sheets um, or just write one from scratch, which is probably much harder. Uh, but you can find uh, the existing styles on your config folder for matplotlib. So usually in your home folder under .config on Mac and Linux or in Windows, it's usually in where the um, matplotlib package was installed. And uh, what I did is I customized the ggplot, the default ggplot style a little bit. And I want to show you this, um, this new style sheet. So. What we have here are various definitions and settings. I'm not gonna go over all of them, uh, just a few. First, we'll, we're gonna have a look at the, if you're not sure about what any of this means, this is a very nice reference image of what a, a matplotlib uh, figure looks like. So it shows you what the different elements are. Uh, so for instance, these are the major ticks and minor ticks, uh, the grid, legend, and so forth. And then you can go back and see, okay, um, you're talking about uh, different, oops, what did I do? Apparently I went back. So uh, you can uh, use that to um, kind of map definitions to uh, areas in the plot. Uh, of course, you can just go to the official documentation as well, but let's have a look at this, the result of this uh, new style, and then I'll go over the important differences. So what I try to do is actually recreate the uh, the ggplot2 uh, color scheme, which starts from this specific color and then just goes to complementary colors on the color wheel. Uh, so we have seven complementary colors uh, here that are default, uh, as well as a white background with these dotted uh, grid lines. Uh, that generally, the settings I change here are, is the grid color, which is this bright gray. Sorry as well as the dotted grid line, uh, line style. And uh, the font size, the default font size is slightly bigger for titles, as well as I'm picking an Arial font. Why Arial? Not because I think it's a particularly pretty font, but because I knew it's gonna be available in mostly any computer as a system font. But of course you can select your own font here, even high, higher end, maybe proprietary uh, fonts and you can get even better results. So uh, this is the style we're actually gonna use for the rest of this talk. Uh, so just to sum this up, the part of styles, I think you guys should try uh, using styles, some of the existing styles, just test them out if you want. You can use this function to test all of the styles that Matplotlib can generate and then select the one you like. And if you wanna change it, you can edit or and, uh, recreate or add a new style and uh, just make a, a style that is uh, more to your taste. And if you have designers in your team, of course you can use them to help you f to get even better looking styles. Um, okay, so that's something about styles. Any questions so far? No, okie dokie. Okay, so further to explore, of course the highest expiration for data nerds or nerds anywhere in the world is XKCD style. <laughs> 
uh, and there's actually a tutorial to, of, of uh, how you can create uh, this style in Matplotlib by Jake Venerplas, which you're probably familiar with in the data world. And uh, there's also a, a built-in Matplotlib method for XKCD. I did not test this one out yet, but I'm sure it's a lot of fun to see how you can get these XKCD looking uh, plots. And of course, if you do that, you have to make them funny as well. But uh, yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> All right, so the next technique I'd like to discuss here is uh, figures and axis objects. So um, what are those? So figures, figures are the, so to speak, the canvas area of your plotting. So you can create a bunch of plots on a figure and actually um, until you display your plot, everything you draw, every new plot you add is going to be on the current figure object. Um, so, how do we generate figures? We can actually generate figures directly, uh, but I'm going to show you a different method that uses the subplots function, which I find to be a little bit uh, more useful because usually you want to maybe create more than one chart uh, in, in a figure, and you can do that or not do that with a subplots function, but um, the nicest thing, which I'm going to emphasize here, is that you can control the figure size. So one thing uh, m most of us do when we start working with matplotlib is we just plot directly with plt.plot or plt.scatter. And when you do that, you get a specific figure size. You get a plot size that is usually quite small, that is the default size. And the only way for you to change that is by changing the default size on the RC parameters on the general uh, settings for matplotlib. But the nice thing about creating a figure object is that whenever you do that, you have the ability to define the figure size directly. So that is already a very nice thing about figures. But of course, another thing you can do is you can decide how many plots you want to have in that figure. Maybe you want to have four plots, how you want them to be arranged. Maybe you want to have like three plots side by side in one row or more. In this example, we have actually two rows and two columns. Uh, I'm just gonna say, I'm not gonna show it, but you can actually have variable size plots as well. So you can have a plot that takes half a column or one that takes three columns, then next to one has one column. So you can investigate that. We're not gonna watch it, but uh, not gonna demonstrate it here, but it's possible. We're gonna see just symmetrical, uh, uh, size plots. So what happens when you, um, when you run this, uh, this function? So the plt.subplots uh, function returns two objects. One is your figure and another is the axis object. What is this axis object? Um, okay, so if we actually just print it out, we can see that we have the result of this specific call gives us uh, an array, a matrix actually, of uh, what's called an axis plot subplot object. So since we defined that we have two rows and two columns, we actually have two rows and columns of these axis subplot objects. And uh, this is how it looks like out of the box. Of course, it doesn't have any data, but it does have a place, a figure, and these designated places to have four subplots. And each one of those is uh, your area for plotting in that specific place, in that specific cell, so to speak. Okay, so um, a lot of the time, some, sometime, for instance, in, in this example right here, we want to have a very specific plot in every cell in a very specific place. So I wanted to have a histogram right here and then a, a, a line plot here and then a box plot here. And what you can do is you can specifically address each one of those axis objects and then you can um, uh, plot on them. So how do we do that? Let's have a look at the function that draws this, uh, these plots. So what we have here is this is actually the line, okie dokie, 
uh, that uh, generated that subplot. So we have the figure and the axis uh, matrix with a three uh, rows and two columns of charts and a figure size of 16 by 18. By the way, these numbers correspond to pixels. They represent 100, 100 pixels each. So this is actually a 1,600 pixels uh, wide and 1,800 pixels long uh, chart or figure. So sometimes when you have a long matrix, matrix you want to again address a specific cell. That you can do that the same way you access an, um, a NumPy matrix by going to the specific index of the row and the column and if you have more then of course you can go for of course actually you can't not here this is a two-dimensional thing but so for instance if I want to go to the leftmost and uppermost cell I would go to the index zero uh, comma and another zero okay but a lot of the time you don't really care about that you just want to want you want to access the uh, the axis objects one by one so you can actually flatten them to get a flat array instead of a matrix, which is easier to handle, which is what I do here with the uh, dot flat function. That way you can just access one index at a time. And then we go to ax ax at index zero, and we can draw a histogram right there. And later we can, of course, uh, set the titles and set the Y labels and X labels and anything else you want to do. And that is the first, uh, the first plot, which is the leftmost and uppermost uh, plot. Then we can go to the next one, which is number one, index number one, which is the second plot, and then uh, draw the line plots on them, go to the third one, draw a bar plot, etc. Okay, so that's how you actually access this matrix, or now a flat array of axis objects. And this is a very convenient way. Uh, so if you don't really care about this very specific placement you just want to have them one by one maybe you actually want to have the same the same kind of plot over and over for instance I'm just gonna show you the, the code in a second but this uh, this is from the Boston data set the Boston house prices uh, data set if you're familiar with it so we actually have four identical plots identical in the term that they're all histograms okay they're just four. They each represent a category or a group, a grouping of the uh, room numbers, the average room numbers. So we have four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine room, uh, rooms. And we have the histogram of the median price of each group. So in this case, you don't really care what plot is where. You just want it to be in order, in the order that you want. You want it to be uh, the room, the four, five, six, seven, et cetera number rooms one after the other, which is an ideal case for having a flat axis object, a flattened axis object. So if you guys want to look at the, the code that generated this, it's right here. We're just loading the Boston data set again, like we did with the Iris data set, converting it to a, a data frame for pandas. And then here we are plotting. So we're generating a two by three uh, axis object in a figure, flattening it, and then we're just going uh, through the, uh, the group by result that we have here, or actually, um, yeah, so this is, uh, we're, we actually bind the data, bind it by the room numbers, so this is the, uh, the method. We're going over each bin, and then we're plotting a histogram of the median value for that bind data. Um, so this is a very, uh, a very, uh, common example for when you would do you do that something that you also want to do quite often is use the tight layout uh, uh, function the tight layout function rearranges your axes um, and uh, the reason you want to do do that is especially when you have small plots sometimes small plots with large fonts sometimes the text would just get cramped and just the the plot would just become completely mishappen and unreadable. And this just fixes it. It's a very uh, nice function. Um, since I don't really have a lot more time, I'm not going to get into it. You can read, of course, the documentation. But it's a very easy fix, usually, when you have weird stuff happening with your plots. 
Okay, uh, I only have five minutes. I knew that I'm not going to make through the entire uh, notebook. You can, of course, see it later, but I'm going to just skim uh, as much as I can of the data that we have here, the, the techniques we have here. So next thing I want to show you is how to use color maps. In R, uh, in ggplot, uh, when you plug in another variable to your data, you can use another var variable as a color uh, for your data, which is of adding another visual dimension without adding a physical spatial dimension. So instead of like having a 3D chart, you can have a 2D chart with color, which is much more readable usually, and you can do it very easily. And uh, what we have here, uh, this is uh, an example of uh, how you can do that, uh, or, or what we're going to do here. Um, so for instance, this is a pretty boring kind of plot that we have like three iris species and the mean sepal, uh, sepal length by species. And this, in my opinion at least, is much nicer by showing each uh, species as a different color. Um, so how can we do that? Um, that's pretty simple. What we can do when we draw the bar, we can plug in a color and then use something called a color map. Uh, and the colors within that color map to represent the colors. So what is a color map? A color map has two main functions. Um, one is just to be a repository of nice colors that you can use, and Matplotlib has a nice uh, range of useful color maps, like the Vega 10 and 20 uh, list of colors. But another thing is mapping, of course. If you want to map values to color, something that is very common in heat maps, heat map plots or not other kinds of plot, uh, then you can use a color map for that. There's a lot of funny talks of how what used to be the default color map for a map of libjet is terrible. You might have heard about that, but if not, uh, you'll be happy to know that this is no longer the default color map. But you can choose what color map you want, and uh, there's actually a nice list, uh, and we have in the same repository here, we actually have... Um, Oh, it seems like I ran out of time. So, okay, so I'm just going to skim quite a bit more. I'm just, I just want to mention that we have um, a few functions here that you could adopt that are useful for easily uh, getting color maps used, used in your plots. For instance, if you want to do this, uh, if you want to, let's say, uh, show a scatter plot and use the color of the species as a, a third dimension here, then this function right here is going to be very uh, handy for you. Essentially, you can get uh, legend handles and colors uh, using this function, and then you can just plug that in as a color and plug in the handles as the handles for your legend object, and you can just automatically get this. So this is trying to replicate as the ease of by which you get this effect in ggplot2. Um, and there's another function for doing a similar thing with normalized values. Um, so this, for instance, is a chart where we have, again, an x and a y, and the color is another dimension. Um, with the same function. So values to colors, that's a function you have here where you can have uh, a Z, a third dimension uh, displayed as a color in your plot. It's pretty handy. Um, and I think maybe I'll stop right here. We're almost at the end. I'm sorry, uh, but of course you can see the rest of the code online. And if you have any questions, I'll try to answer maybe one or two. Or maybe we have time for that. One, one, one question. So. Yes. Any questions? Yes. What do you think about the new building with uh, I don't like it that much, honestly, but I think, uh, well, it's obviously better than JET. <laughs> it's much more easy to interpret, but uh, I personally prefer others such as uh, Inferno, Magma, Autumn, uh, or just the reds or the blues. So I think they are more easily interpretable. Okay, thanks.